If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. Your Bibles may say the Acts of the Apostles, but really it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Can you say amen? Uh, recently, I've finished a study on the book of Acts, just studying that first church, that New Testament church 2,000 years ago that was birthed on the day of Pentecost when God poured out his Spirit on that upper room, 120 were gathered. And from that day to this day, the church has been moving forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you want to be that church? Let's be that church. Uh, of all the different things that we could become as a spiritual family, uh, let's look at the blueprint of the book of Acts and let's walk in that same spirit. If you're taking notes because history makers are note takers, I want you to write this down. The title of the message today is simply this, that church faces opposition. That church faces opposition. If you, if you do a study, a word study in the book of Acts, there's 28 chapters, but you're going to find specific words that are repeated again and again. It kind of gives us an indication of what one of the major themes of the book of Acts is nine times you find the word arrested, 14 times you see the word jailed, four times is the word stoned, and I'm not talking about a drug party either. Um, six times you find the word beaten, 26 times is the word prison, and kill is found 14 times. That's a total of 73. In 28 chapters, you see 73 different experiences of opposition being mentioned. How many of you know, as believers, we are going to fight some battles? You say, Mike, can you be a little more positive? Yes, I'm positive. As believers, we will fight a lot of battles. But the truth is this. If God tells us that the road ahead is difficult, then every bump and bruise along the way should let us know we're headed in the right direction. In fact, there's something validating about opposition. My mama used to say it like this. If you haven't run into the devil, you might be running with him. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You see, when I was in the eighth grade, I signed up to play football. Do we have any football players in the house? A few of us? Yeah. I, I signed up not necessarily because I, I was good at football, but all my friends wanted to play football. And so out of peer pressure, I went out for the team. After the first practice, I got home. I said, Dad, I quit. He said, why? I said, because they tackled me. It hurt. And my dad said, son, if you're going to play football, part of the game is being hit. Listen, if we're going to say yes to Jesus, if we're going to follow Christ, how many of you know we're going to take some hits? It's a part of the experience. You know, I'm a little concerned about the, there's kind of a, a generic brand of Christianity that I see starting to sweep Western culture. It, it, it's, it's kind of an off brand. It, 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 it's not exactly biblical. It kind of feels like it. It, it seems like it, but it's not the same. Kind of like when you wanted to get a Dr. Pepper and your mom brought home Dr. Thunder. <laughs> do you remember that? Did your mom ever do that? You, you, you like Coca-Cola. You thought you were getting Coca-Cola. You didn't know you were drinking Czech Cola. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> I remember one time, man, and I, I, I loved Fruit Loops. And I wanted mom to get, get this big old giant family size of Fruit Loops. And she brought home not a box, but a bag of Tutti Fruities. Remember? <laughs> and she's like, oh, it's all the same. And you, you won't even notice. It's cheaper. You won't even notice. The no, mama, we know the difference. There's a cheaper version of Christianity that's starting to proliferate Western culture. And it's this idea that God wants to make you happy. God wants to make you comfortable. God wants to make you successful. And though there's nothing wrong with happy or comfortable or successful, what if the purpose of being a Christian is for God to make us like Jesus? 
What if a disciple of Christ, as students, as followers of Jesus, our lives are supposed to resemble that of our master? Can somebody say amen? amen. Jesus had a wilderness. Jesus experienced a Gethsemane. Jesus had a Judas. Come on, somebody. Now, what makes us think as followers of Christ, we won't walk in a wilderness, experience the crushing of a Gethsemane, or even have friends that betray us? Uh, Listen, if we're not facing opposition, I wonder, are we truly following Jesus? You see, I've said this probably a thousand times, and I'm sure you've probably said it too. I just want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, help us to be your hands and your feet. You guys have done that in a beautiful way this past weekend. I mean, love LA, so many acts of kindness, man, showing people that God cares for them, bringing value to those that are broken and poor and, and dysfunctional and those that are marginalized. Lord, we just want to be your hands and be your feet. And while that's a great thought, let me ask you this. What happened to the hands of Jesus? 2,000 years ago, they nailed those hands to a cross. Come on, somebody. What happened to the feet of Jesus? You and I, it tells me this, that as followers of Christ, even as his hands and his feet were going to be pierced, we're going to be pressed, there's, we're going to be opposed. And so my question to you is this, what do you do? How do you handle opposition when it comes a against you? How do you walk through a season of adversity? Some of you, I felt this during worship, some of you are in this moment right now. Some of you have so many pains and pressures in your world, and today is going to help you. In fact, what I want to do is look at the early church, this book of Acts church, and see what they did when opposition came against them. Acts chapter 5, verse 29 The background to this story, the apostle Peter is speaking here. Now, Peter had been arrested. He had been placed in jail. The Holy Spirit supernaturally released him, brought him to freedom, and Peter now is preaching and teaching in the synagogue again, and the religious leaders are questioning him. They're threatening him, and they're about to arrest him, and look at what he says in verse 29. But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did all of this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins. Somebody say repent. I love it. That's been the message of the gospel for 2,000 years. He did all of this so the people would repent of their sins and be forgiven. And we are witnesses of these things. Somebody say witnesses. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. Now consider this, Peter, a little context. Two months prior to this, Peter was denying Jesus. When Jesus had been arrested and put on trial... Peter follows behind, kind of in the shadows. He's confronted by a little servant girl that says, wait a second, you're one of his followers. And he was so afraid to be discovered that he denied Christ. Three times we see Peter denied. This is just two months prior. And now here, Peter's being confronted by the religious leaders, and he's got such courage. He says, wait a second, we ought to obey God rather than man. What brought about this transformation? It was the power of the Holy Spirit in Peter's life. When we face opposition, I want to give you three simple thoughts, and the first is this. Number one, we've got to be strong in conviction. Strong in conviction. Peter was so convinced in the core of his soul. You know there's a difference between beliefs and convictions? Beliefs are what you hold but convictions are what hold you. Do you know in the very core of your soul 
that Jesus, who died for you, is not just your Savior, but he's your keeper. Do you know that, that he's the power inside of you? you? You see, it's one thing to have a knowledge of God, but it's another thing to have an experience with God. A part of our responsibilities as pastors, Jonathan and I talk about, you know, we teach and we train and we equip and we want you to have the tools that you need. But it's, it's not enough to just grow in your information. You've got to have revelation. You've got to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And that's what these moments are for. I love how Jonathan facilitates that. You know, your pastor can not only preach, but he can sing. And I am just jealous of that, dude. Because sometimes if I get hung up preaching, I'm thinking, man, there's no hope for me. If he gets hung up, he can break out in a song. <laughs> Turn it into a worship experience. I mean, it's just like heaven coming down. I'm like, Lord Jesus. We, we, you got to have an encounter with God. It's not enough to just grow in head knowledge. You have to have a heart experience. And Peter had this. He didn't just have information. He had revelation. And it created an iron in his soul. It, it created a conviction that it didn't matter what was coming against him. It didn't matter the pressure of the opposition or what the culture was saying. He was going to stand for Christ. I, I pray that God would give us men with backbone. I think we got a lot of wishbone, but what we need is more backbone. Lord, give us dads who will model what they want multiplied in their home. God, give us men who won't bow their knee to the angry mob. Lord, would you give us women who pray over their kids and raise and train these kids in the fear and the admonition of the Lord? God, would you give us young adults who will be thermostats and not thermometers? You see, a thermometer is a reflection of its environment, but a thermostat sets its environment. God, would you give us students who take a stand on their campus? God, give us students who are committed to sexual purity, who wait until marriage. Give us a generation who knows how to treat each other with respect because everybody was made in the image of God. Do we have that kind of conviction to guide us and direct us? My, my fear is sometimes we're waiting for things to get easier. Yeah. Why are we just waiting for things? Man, I'm, it's like being at the bus stop, and you're waiting for the easy bus to come by and to pick you up. How many know that bus is not coming? We're, we're, we're waiting for things to get easier, but what we need to do is learn to handle hard better. Paul told Timothy, in the last days, perilous times will come. How many of you are convinced we're living in some of these last days? It, it, it's not getting easier, but guess what? God says the power inside of you is greater than the opposition in front of you. The scripture says no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you in judgment will be condemned. Do you know greater is he that is in us? Oh, Lord, let us be convinced in who you are and who we belong to. Let us be strong in conviction. You see, when Peter and the apostles were being persecuted, they didn't pray for their problems to go away. They said, Lord, give us boldness to proclaim the truth, even in spite of what's coming against us. Look at what it says, Acts 4.29. This is what they said. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness. Somebody say boldness. In the Greek, it means freedom or confidence. Give us great boldness in preaching and proclaiming your word. Oh, man. I, I, here's what I sense in this house. Bethany Church has the backbone of the Holy Spirit. And, and you don't change based on what's popular and what's not. You're convinced in the truth of God's word. Do you know if you're not convinced in the authority of Scripture, you'll be a slave to whatever sounds good? And you know there are a lot of things that sound good, but they're not God. Where do we get conviction? It's from the authority of this book. That's why your pastor will preach and teach this word faithfully again and again. And guess what? The fruit of it speaks for itself. you got to make a decision in who you are in Christ. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. My decision has been made. I've stepped over the line. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still.
My past is redeemed. My present makes sense and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, or popularity. I don't have to be right, be tops, be first, be praised, be recognized, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by patience. I love by prayer. I labor by power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few, but my God is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, be compromised, be turned back, lured away, detoured, distracted, deluded, discouraged, or dismayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, let up, slow up, or shut up until I preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I will go until he comes. I'll give until I drop. I'll preach until I'll know, and I'll work until he stops. And when he comes back to receive his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me. My colors will be clear. I belong to Jesus. Come on, put your hands together if you know you're his. Strong in conviction. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Listen, we serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. Somebody say he's a lion. I'm afraid we've turned the lion into some, some little house cat that's sitting on grandma's lap. Listen, let's release the lion inside of us. Let us be a church who is convinced in Jesus. Be strong in conviction. You know, sometimes I tried to pray my problems away from me. I'm guilty of saying, Lord, just deliver me from this problem. And God says, I've allowed this problem for two reasons. First of all, I'm trying to grow your faith. How many know that struggle produces strength? Some of you are facing some problems right now, and this is God's way of testing you. Testing is his method of promotion. How many know you can't go from the fourth grade to the fifth grade unless you pass some tests? You've prayed for promotion, and God's sending you tests. And the test is to grow you. God allows us to walk through problems not only to grow our faith, but to advance his kingdom. A watching world is looking at you and me. How we handle opposition will either declare that there's a living God in us or we're atheists. We believe God, but he don't exist in our lives. Number one, strong in conviction. It's amazing how the church exploded in growth, not because of prosperity, but because of persecution. There's something in that. Number one, strong in conviction. Number two, steady in compassion. This is how the church responded. They weren't just strong in their convictions, but they were steady in compassion. You say, wait a second, Mike. What about the lion of the tribe? You, you told me to be strong in my convictions. I'm going on Facebook, and I'm going to rat-a-tat-tat on all my friends, and I'm going to put them in their place and tell them off in Jesus' name. How many of you know that boldness does not mean being obnoxious? It doesn't mean we get to be rude. I, I think the worst thing is a Christian that's a jerk. You just, you, you're not representing Christ. Conviction takes strength, but there's also this thing called compassion. We got to love people. You see, uh, the, the, the early church, these apostles knew that their mission was to bring the gospel to people? It was to care about the people that God had placed in front of them. Have you ever talked to somebody and you could tell their heart was so cold and so callous, you're thinking, man, you must have fought some battles? If we're not careful, those battles that we fight, they make us bitter and not better. You know, don't allow the people or things coming against you to cause your heart to shrink. These early disciples knew that the opposition they faced, they weren't enemies to be defeated. They were souls to be redeemed. There's a redemptive plan of God in every conflict. And, and here's something I think that needs to be said, and I want you to jot this down. People are not the enemy, but the enemy will use people. 
People are not your enemy. Some of you are fighting some battles and you're facing some opposition, maybe at school, maybe at work, maybe there's something even in your family. Please, please don't get confused. Don't fight in the natural a spiritual battle. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. What does that tell me? My boss is not my enemy. My spouse is not my enemy. My next door neighbor is not my enemy. It doesn't mean that the enemy won't use those people, but if you fight a spiritual battle in a natural way, you're going to burn bridges and you're not going to build the kingdom. I mean, consider this. Uh, the book of Acts, again, how, did they, how were they steady in their compassion? The, the Bible says that Stephen was the first martyr of the New Testament church. Stephen spoke with such conviction that the religious leaders, they covered their ears. They didn't want to hear anything he had to say, so they picked up stones. And as they were stoning Stephen at his execution, I want you to hear his final words. Here's what Stephen prayed. The Bible says in Acts 7, 59, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees and he shouted these final words, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Now, how many of you, if you were in that situation, you'd be praying a prayer, but it'd be a little different. I would be praying something like this, Lord, you know them lightning bolts you got stored up in heaven? Send them right now on the heads of my enemies. Oh, yeah, I'd be praying a different prayer. Listen, your flesh sometimes want to re wants to react when you're being attacked. But the Bible says don't respond in the flesh. Don't react according to your flesh. You've got to respond in the spirit. It, it, it's, it's fascinating to me that Stephen prayed this prayer. Does that prayer sound familiar to you? Who else prayed that prayer? Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. You know, the truth is, for, there are a lot of times we walk through painful experiences, and the people that have hurt us don't even know what they're doing. They, and Jesus was forgiving those who were executing him. Uh, Stephen was doing the same. Here's why it's important for us to pray for our enemies. I want you to hear this. I didn't say this in the first service, but I saved this just for you. Praying for your enemies may not change your enemies, but it will keep your enemies from changing you. Amen. This is a big deal. Why should I pray for my enemies? They're never going to change. Well, if you don't pray for them, your enemies are starting to change how you think, how you respond, how you feel. Uh, some of you have been hurt by people in your past, and because you can't release them, you have become the prisoner. You, you, you wake up with them and have coffee with them every morning. Man, you take them to lunch. Man, you, you work all day with them. When you get home at night and lay your head on your pillow, they tuck you in bed. Your enemies are changing you. Uh, don't let the, the kindness in your soul be corrupted by the pain that's been perpetrated against you. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Do you know you and I can't hate somebody into the kingdom? It's not going to happen. We have to love people into the kingdom, even at personal expense. There's a phrase that I came across a couple of months ago, and I want you to write this down. It's called holding frame, okay? Holding frame. Write that down. You say, Mike, what is holding frame? Holding frame is staying calm and composed under pressure. Holding frame is setting and maintaining healthy boundaries. Holding frame is not getting drawn into emotional reactions or drama. Somebody say, save the drama, save the drama. for your mama. <laughs> Holding frame is about maintaining your own identity and values and purpose. When Jesus was on trial and he was brought before Pilate, guess what? Jesus held frame. All of his accusers, man, they were lying about him. They were falsely accusing him, making stuff up. And Jesus, the Bible says, as a lamb led to the slaughter, so he opened not his mouth. 
Pilate says, wait a second, aren't you even going to defend yourself? Don't you know that I have the power to either condemn you or to set you free? And Jesus held frame. He said, oh, no. The only power you have has been given to you by my Father in heaven. And no man takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and to raise it up again. Hold frame. Some of you are being attacked, and it's the enemy trying to bait you. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait of hate. You, you, you take that bait, then you start to get bitter. And then one day you look in the mirror and you don't even like the person you've become. Yeah. Pastor Larry Stockstill, he told me this years ago. I'll, I'll never forget this. And I, I meant to ask him earlier if he remembered having this conversation. When Rachel and I first stepped in to lead Healing Place Church, we spent some time with him and Sister Melanie. And like a spiritual father, just... I mean, spoken to my life. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your family. I, I feel like he has loved me like a spiritual son. And he told me one time, he said, Pastor Mike, I want you to know that you're going to have to handle some difficult conversations. You're going to have to make some decisions that won't be popular. And people will oppose you. They'll come against you, and you're going to have to hold frame. He didn't use that language, but now I'm, I'm starting to understand what he was saying 12, 13 years ago. He said, I've, I've discovered something that has helped me in those moments of conflict and confrontation. He said, there's a simple thing just with your posture. He said, if I go into a conversation, and I know it, it, it has the potential to really escalate. He says, I sat there with my palms up in my lap. He says, I'm seated at the table, and I'll just slip my hands under the table and put my palms in my lap. Would you do that right now? Would you just sit there, and, and with your palms up, I want you to rest your hands on the back of your legs. He said, you know, in this posture, it helps me to de-escalate. Again, sometimes when drama comes at you, you don't have to respond with the same intensity. A good way to disarm it, he said, is to sit there with your palms up. This is a posture that helps me to lean in and listen. It's also a posture that helps me to receive what God wants to give me. How many of you know this is different than this? This is different than this. This is different than this. And too many times we get drawn into a conflict and what the world sees is this when what Jesus teaches is this. Does that make sense? You see, the scripture tells us love is patient. Love is kind. 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or re resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Listen to me, brothers, sisters. You can be strong in conviction and then you can be steady in compassion. The world needs both. Now, let me finish. Has this been helpful today? Yeah. Good. Thank you, Lord. Let me give this final thought. Final thought. Somebody say strong in conviction. Strong in conviction. Say steady in compassion. Steady in compassion. Say sold out, sold out to the cause. Jesus told his disciples, I love this moment. In Matthew 16, he tells his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they respond by saying, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, John the Baptist, or one of the prophets. He says, okay, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up, and he says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. From now on, your name is Peter. And that word in the Greek is Petros, which means little rock. From now on, your name is Peter. Then Jesus says in verse 18, and upon this rock, this big rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you know that's the first time in the scriptures that the word church is introduced? And the, consider the context. Jesus speaks of the church within the context of conflict. He says the gates of hell. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not 
prevail. It doesn't mean that you won't experience some pain and some adversity, but just know this, whatever is coming against the church, because we're built on the rock, come on somebody, we will outlast all of our enemies, all of our critics, all of our accusation, if we will just hang in there and stay steady on the rock. Uh, let me give you this final quick history lesson. I want to take just a couple of minutes to do it, but in Daniel, Daniel prophesied a, a lot of things. And in Daniel, he spoke of kingdoms and rulers that would rise and that would fall. But he said the kingdom of God would last for all of eternity. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, had a dream. And he gathered all of his, his enchanters and magicians and sorcerers and, 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 and all of the guys that had wisdom and said, listen, I want you to tell me what I dreamed. I'm not going to tell you what it was. You tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. How many know that's impossible? They didn't know. They were at a loss. At the risk of losing their lives, they reached out to Daniel because he, was, he worshiped the God of the Hebrews. And how many of you know that God is not only the giver of dreams, but he can reveal what those dreams mean? And so here comes Daniel, and Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, hey, here's what you dreamed. You dreamed about a statue, and this statue had four different segments. It had a head of gold, it had chest and arms of silver, it had belly and thighs of bronze, and it had feet of iron and clay. And what Daniel began to tell the king was that statue represents empires and kingdoms, both current and those that are to come. The head would represent the Babylonian Empire. The chest and arms represented the Persian Empire. The belly and thighs represented the Greek Empire. And then finally, the feet represented the Roman Empire. Did you know of those four empires, every single one of them oppressed the nation of Israel? Israel was victim of the aggression of each one of these empires. But God used every empire to promote the gospel and advance the kingdom. In 586 B.C., Babylon came into Jerusalem, burnt the city to the ground, destroyed the temple, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, and exiled so many Jewish people all over the world. It's called the Diaspora. They were scattered all over the world. That was the Babylonian Empire. And then just 50 years later, here came the Persian Empire. And King Cyrus said, listen, Jews, go back to Jerusalem and rebuild your temple. Strengthen and fortify the city of Jerusalem and allow the walls to be rebuilt. And then it wasn't long after that, about 330 B.C., here comes King Cyrus, I mean uh, 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 Alexander, Alexander the Great, the, the Greek Empire. And under the Greek Empire, you had a common language and you had a common culture. And then during the times of Christ, we see that the Romans were in power. And what they did was they, they made the roads and rebuilt the infrastructure. And here's how God used every single empire to advance his kingdom. The scattering of the Jews sent the message to the four corners of the earth. The gathering of the Jews in Jerusalem strengthened the local uh, temple of worship. And then here comes the Greek empire, and now you have a common language so you can communicate with other peoples and people group. And now under the Romans, now you have the apostle Paul planting churches all over the world. Do you see how what was supposed to destroy them actually advanced the purposes of God? Now, here's the final verse, Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. He says, as you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain. We talked about that rock. What, what rock are we talking about here? Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build much. He says, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like a chaff, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. Listen to me. Listen to me, church. Hear me. In a couple of weeks, we will cast votes for the next president of the United States. And I know that there's a lot of fear and uncertainty and a lot of different thoughts surrounding it. The political rhetoric is at an all-time high. For the people of God, we need to know this. We are built on a rock. 
and kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Your life, my life, I'll tell you this, I'll just speak for myself. I have been blessed under every administration. Whoever was in the White House, you know why? Because the source of my blessing has never been Washington, D.C. I am a citizen of a kingdom that's not of this world. And so I, I say this to encourage you. We're at a moment in history where we don't have to be afraid. We can sell out to the cause of Christ knowing that our king and his kingdom will never end. Can you say amen? You receive that today. Come on, put your hands together if you believe that.